six seven eight M U L T I zero five. five. <laughs> yes. <laughs> If you're happy with the same old ways of dating... If you enjoy sucking at communication... And you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships... Broaden your sexual horizons... Develop a better understanding of yourself... Or learn more about non-monogamy... Then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multiamory Podcast. On this episode of the Multi Emory Podcast, we are talking with special guest The One True Will about asexuality. And asexuality is something we've we've brought up a few times on this show, but we haven't ever had someone on to really talk about what that really means, some of the misconceptions that people have about it. So we were super excited to have Will on as our guest. And I think the really interesting thing is the fact that there's actually a fair number of people who are on the asexual spectrum who are active in the polyamorous and non-monogamous community, um, which is a surprise to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so we'll definitely get to that later on in the interview. Mm -hmm. um, so something we want to talk to you about first, though, before we start moving into the interview is that we have an exciting new addition to multi-amory. Let's call it an experiment. Yeah, we're we we committing like, to it, calling it an addition. It's an exciting new edition <laughs> of a phone number. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, and and everyone else. You've heard it here. We have a phone number now. It is. Uh, can I say it? <laughs> yeah, you can say it. Okay, it's six seven eight M U L T I zero five. Pretty sweet, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now. If the people have a hard time remembering that, Jace did come up with a catchy jingle. <sighs> You're going to make me do it? Yes, please yeah, do it. You were like, okay. I wish okay. we could okay. do it together, Jace. What's that phone number to my favorite polyamory podcast that I'm trying to remember? Hmm, I can't seem to recall it. It is 678-M-U-L-T-I-05. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ha cha cha. Yeah, we're gonna work out a whole dance number and harmonies oh and, and everything. But. I'm super so excited. So what is the purpose of this phone number? So the purpose of this phone number is that you can if you have questions for us, you can call in and leave a voicemail for us and we will select some of those questions to play on the show and to answer those questions. Uh so it's a really exciting thing. It's a segment that we're gonna try out on the show, see how people like it. Um you know, obviously, if you call in, uh, it could get played on the air. So, you know, don't say names of people. You don't have permission to use their names or give any don't personal details. Don't accidentally leave your social security number. Right, right. Um, although, if you do want to call and leave your credit card number for us, like, that's cool. That's great. Uh, that we won't play that on the show. Okay. That's just for us. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, yeah, we're really excited about this. So if you have questions or you want to explain a certain situation that you've got going on in your life, uh, just call the number. And that number, again, is 678-M-U-L-T-I-05. Yeah. <laughs> nice. It's <laughs> not right. like a whip sound. It's like a, <laughs> like a symbol. You know? Yeah. Or like you're slapping someone's ass. Oh, oh I like that. That's good. That's really good. That's really good. Yeah. Okay, are we going to go to this interview now? Yeah. All right. Um, so we're going to go into this interview. And just to start us off, I do want to clarify just by reading um, a little definition here uh, from asexuality.org. And that's that an asexual is someone who does not experience sexual attraction. Unlike celibacy, where people choose, asexuality is an intrinsic part of who someone is. It's about how they experience the world rather than just the choices that they make within that. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot of variety within it, and we're going to get into that with Will. So let's get to that now. And here we are with our very special guest, the one true Will. Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to have someone on here to talk about the ACE community. Um, can you... Just tell us a little bit about who you are and what the asexuality group was that you used to lead and, and stuff like that. Uh, sure. So I am a, a non-binary asexual, and um, I typically go by he and him. Um, I've grown up 
simply just defaulting into uh, into that uh, because it took me a very long time to discover this. Um, growing up in Oklahoma in the 90s, we didn't exactly have a whole lot of uh, sexuality information available. Oh, wow. <laughs> and yeah. so that... Um, uh, that resulted in a lot of uh, very confusing times. So it's uh, something that in a lot of ways I, I struggled with until um, until a few years ago, actually, yeah. when um, my, uh, my wife and I opened up our marriage and I started really diving into research. Um, actually, it was OkCupid okay that, that spawned this whole thing because uh, I, I saw this list of dropdowns and I'm like, what what does all of this mean? Wow. <laughs> and then and then it hit me. Like, wow, here's here's a word to describe a thing that I have felt this whole life. And um, it was it was it was strange and a lot of stuff clicked into place. And at first I was using the, uh, uh, the demisexuality label, but mm-hmm. I've uh, decided since then that I would like to use the, the umbrella term asexuality because I've noticed a lot of people use demi in a way that really doesn't fit the real definition. So I've started using ace as a way to really bring light to very specifically what this is in, in very black and white terms. Is there a way to describe uh, demisexuality versus asexuality? And what are some misconceptions between the two or between, you know, just what asexuality is in general? Uh, Yes. So demisexuality falls under the umbrella of asexuality because asexuality is a spectrum. And it's a a somewhat nonlinear spectrum in that it's more of a two-dimensional axis where you can have some things... um, some things that don't really fit together in, in sort of a linear progression. But demisexuality fits more on the end that is, is closer, to, uh, uh, closer to the average sexual experience um, in that uh, you're still more likely to, to find people that you are sexually attracted to, but it requires a lot of work. Very specifically, Mm. demisexuality requires a deep emotional connection before any sort of sexual feelings can develop. And what I've noticed in speaking with other people that use the, the demi label, a lot of times it's used not to really talk about Uh, what they're experiencing and instead reflects behavioral choices that they make. Um, For example, if you experience sexual attraction, but you choose to wait until you get to know someone, that's fine, but that's a behavior Mm. versus someone who does not feel anything at all until after they've known someone for a while. And then they realize like one day, like, Oh, I would really like to cuddle this person or kiss this person or, you know, be more intimate. And that difference in the experience, how that information is processed by the brain versus behavior is what ultimately drove me to decide to start using the, the asexual, excuse me, to use the asexual uh, umbrella term, because that really clearly, like from the beginning indicates like, there is something very, very different about the way that I process sexual information than what you may be used to. Yeah, that's interesting because I have met some people who use the demisexual label as the, like as though it's like, well, yeah, no, I think I'm demisexual. Like, I definitely like I need to like someone before I want to have sex with them. Like, as though there's people out there right. who have sex with people that they like hate or like really dislike. Right. You know. That, right. Yeah, I think people don't realize that it is on this deeper, like more brain chemical level of of that, yeah, that, that sensation doesn't even arise until the bond is formed. So it is interesting yeah. to, to distinguish that. Well, something that I've wondered a lot about this, um, because obviously, you know, it is a spectrum, kind of like you're talking about. And I feel like in terms of, you know, sex drive and sexual, sexual urges and things like that, it's such a weird thing because we don't really have a clear sense of what normal is. Hmm. Right? right? Like we, we kind of have this, you know, what we get from television and movies or whatever is that as a man, you should be wanting to fuck anything that will let you. 
right. and just all the time. And as a woman, you don't really, uh, you know, just sort of these bullshit things that were fed. But then with the people you talk to, like who your friends are, you might try comparing yourself to what their experience is. But it's we still don't really have this clear. Uh, I don't know. Even the, I, I don't have a clear idea of what's normal or where mine fits with that. I, I'm curious to know because you mentioned that you know obviously you felt very confused growing up, that you faced a lot of challenges feeling this way growing up, and that you know it wasn't until you kind of found this label that it all clicked for you. You're like, oh, like this is who I am. Right. This is what I've been. Um, I mean, what did you think of yourself before you discovered that label and discovered that this was you know a thing? Well, I I definitely felt very broken and lacking, and uh, it was it was very difficult to connect to people because uh, something that we may want to talk about in more detail is a separate part of the conversation. But um, sexual attraction and sex drive are two different things. Interesting. And the yeah. drive is there, but the attraction is not. And I like to compare it to an experience that I think we've all had of being so hungry that nothing sounds good and you don't want to eat anything until you find that one thing that you want to eat. And you're like, yes, give me all of that. Oh, huh. wow. Yeah, that's wow. really interesting. Yeah, that's a great, that's I think, great metaphor. I think a misconception that I had was that asexual means that you're not interested in sex with anyone, essentially. But clearly that's not the case at all. It's it's not the case for me. Uh, okay. Depending on where you are in the spectrum, it can be a it, it, it can be an issue of finding people with whom you have a very serious, uh, deep emotional connection, and then you find ways that you want to express that with them. Yeah. Versus some people on the spectrum feel it very very rarely, maybe only a couple of times in a lifetime, and then. In some places in the spectrum, it's either not interesting at all, or it's even a repulsive thought. Uh, mm -hmm. The same way that uh, the same way that we are repulsed by the idea of sex with minors. It's a uh, it is a, a deeply disturbing idea that they don't even want to hold space for. And yeah. right. you know, we we are all over the place with this spectrum, and that's why. Um, it's easiest to talk about in a linear fashion, but it's really more of a two-dimensional, like, dot array of a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I imagine, um, you know, I know something that I've encountered in my life being, you know, non-monogamous and polyamorous for a number of years is that sometimes a reaction that people have to things that are not quote-unquote normal is to pathologize it. Mm -hmm. And right. I feel that people on the A spectrum, like I'd imagine, probably face that a lot because I know I've seen people on the internet be like, oh, this is a hormone imbalance or no, like this is a problem yes. that can be fixed with medicine. Oh no, this person just needs to do this or just needs to do that. Um, right. And so I'd imagine that's a very common experience. I think so. I think most of us get, at least from family and friends, if not partners, we, we get urged to have our hormones checked. We get urged to go to therapy. Uh, there's always questions around trauma, and mm -hmm. I, I think there's there is some correlation. But I think that people have the order of the chicken and the egg wrong. Yeah. Uh, in that, everyone that I've spoken to who's trusted me with their personal story that does both fall on the asexual spectrum and have trauma in their life, they experience the trauma as a result of being put into a situation that they did not want to be in because they were asexual mm. as opposed yeah. to the asexuality being caused by the trauma itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, was, that makes sense. Yeah. Huh. Jeez. Um, so I, I have a quick question that we probably should have covered earlier on in this. Um, the abbreviation ACE for asexuality. Um, right. Do you know how that came to be? It, it's always felt like it should be an acronym for something, but is it not? Is it just short for asexuality? Uh, yeah, it is. It is just. It is just short for asexual. And there's a. There's a lot of terms. Uh, there's a lot of terms. Um, you know, we've already talked about demisexuality. Uh, we have the the gray ace or the gray asexuality, uh, which is more of the the middle ground. The sort of 
um, rare, a few, a few sexual interests in a lifetime sort of thing. And then, um, you know, without any qualifiers, asexual really should represent someone that has no interest or no desire for sex at all. Mm-hmm. Sort of a sort of a new, a true neutrality there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, our podcast is largely about alternative relationships and mm-hmm. polyamory and non-monogamy, and I think, at least in my own personal experience, I feel like I run into asexual people or people on the a spectrum quite frequently in the poly community. Um, I don't, unfortunately, I don't think there's been enough um, studies or research to get actual statistics on the number of ace people who are also involved in, you know, poly or non-monogamous relationships. Um, but why is it that you think that, like, the poly community, the non-monogamous community, might be appealing for people who are also ace? Uh, for for two very specific reasons, um, which might be two examples under the one, uh, that in having an open structure, we are free to define consciously what our relationship should look like for us mm-hmm. and, and negotiate cool. things. Yeah. And as a result of that, uh, we can... We can negotiate uh, with specific partners and have that deep emotional intimacy and the the connection that we desire, the the romantic gestures and uh, and everything but the sex, and still be able to call someone our partner, and still feel that we are being acknowledged and being accepted for who we are, and not feeling the obligation to fulfill all of someone's needs. So that you are, uh, so that you are free to satisfy your needs through other relationships, and it's not necessarily up to me or anyone else to satisfy all of those needs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, cool. it, and it makes sense, and it's it's so funny because whenever we encounter people who do think that like polyamory, having multiple partners, is about sexual satisfaction, um, yeah. right. <laughs> That they're always like so surprised to learn that there are so many asexual people also involved in alternative relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I would also want to know, I mean, what are the particular challenges that you see um, maintaining a poly relationship or being part of a poly or non-monogamous community as someone who identifies as asexual? Well, it's... Um, it is difficult to navigate some of the more uh, explicitly sexual spaces... Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. It's uh, it's it's not something that gets you invited to any play parties. <laughs> <laughs> sure. It's um, you know there there are still very uh, d- despite the fact that the the open community tends to be a much more uh, egalitarian feminist progressive movement. We still have bits of of old genderized roles. Um, yeah. As Jace mentioned earlier, there's a certain expectation for masculinity that you have to be DTF all the time and, and ready to perform. And I've encountered that a little bit. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting in that in a, in a space where people should be free to be sexual and express their sexuality in their own way, uh, the way that it has been received a few times is that um, they read into my decline as a as some sort of implicit slut shaming. Like it reflects back on them. Like, oh, no, I'm not. I'm not into all of this dirty sex yeah. stuff. What do you mean? Huh. Like, it's I. I right. I've, I'm late for Sunday school. You know, <laughs> and that's and that's not the case. It's just this is this is my expression of sexuality. And that means that, um, you know, if, if I'm, uh, if I'm interested in having some sort of physical contact, it may just be cuddles, even though it's a, even though it's a play party. Um, Mm -hmm. so there's, there's some of that. Um, did that, did that answer the question or is there something more? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It it also made me think about what you were saying earlier about people kind of, um, uh, misusing demisexual almost for the same purpose of what you were describing of I'm polyamorous, but I'm demisexual, meaning I'm not a slut. Yeah. I'm poly, but I'm not a slut. It's this kind of, (laughs) right. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. That is exactly the thing that turned me off from using the demi label. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because that's not the message that I'm trying to send. 
Yeah. It's that I have a very different way of experiencing sexuality and having something as 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 bold as the asexual label prompts people to stop and have a conversation as opposed to assuming one of these various like demi interpretations. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah I guess people use it as like, oh, it means I have standards. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's kinda... ridiculous. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, it just, I was going to ask if it ever gets challenging, because um, we still, I mean, less so maybe in the relationship anarchy movement, but uh, often people who are having sex with each other put those relationships ahead of, like, say, their friendships or other things. So when you take right. sex away from the picture, does one ever feel like, hey, I'm not being put in the same uh, in the same light or shown mm. in the same light or given as much as tension because that element isn't there. That's the thing that I feel could be challenging at times, for sure. Mm -hmm. Is that ever an issue? Uh, yes, constantly. So mm. I do, uh, when it comes to relationship labels, I do like the relationship anarchy uh, for the reason that we can um, choose exactly how we want everything to look. And that... Yeah. Um, for obvious reasons, I don't prioritize my sexual relationships above my non-sexual relationships. Uh, of course. I prioritize my relationships based on level of emotional intimacy and like availability um, mm -hmm. for, on both sides. So there is there there are some frustrations that um, that I've experienced when people start to prioritize their their sexual experiences or their sexual relationships over um, you know over the non. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's definitely an issue, and with I haven't seen that um, so much recently, but I'm curious to see if that if that develops at all. Yeah, and yeah. we were going to ask what your current uh, relationship landscape looks like. Um, well, I recently started seeing someone, wow. and. Um, it is someone that I've known for almost two years, and it was uh, we were friends through this time and confidants, and we trusted each other with everything. And we we even went to the retreat in February uh, together, and um, but not together. We just went and right. just, we um, both went. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. We we both went and drove the, there and back. Um, and did our own things while we were at the retreat. But um, about six weeks ago, we started hanging out um, because a, a local goth club was closing down. And I was putting out the call for friends to like, hey, come party with us. Um, we hung out all weekend, two weekends in a row. Um, and then we, then we started talking about like, hey, is, there's... There's something here, isn't there? Hmm. And um, over the course of several weeks, we started having more and more serious conversations and decided that, yeah, we do want to start transitioning our friendship into a partnership. Nice. And um, I've noticed that in the past week or two weeks, her usage of the word partner has varied a little bit. Like there's a little bit of uncertainty there. And I can't help but wonder if perhaps part of that is because she needs the sexual component in order for yeah. that to be to real count. to That's her, really for that to, for that to click. And, and then, you know, if, if that's the case, you know, that's, that's certainly valid and I respect that, but it's, but it's interesting. I can tell that, um, you know, we're, we're very much in the same space emotionally. So I, I don't really see that we're going to have any problems there. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been a very, like I mentioned earlier, it was a, um, it was, it was an eye opening experience. Um, the first nights, um, that we were going out to the club, she, uh, she met me and the team at my place and, she walked in and something about the way that she was dressed and carried herself and all of those things, it was like the whole, the whole universe disappeared mm -hmm. and it was just the two of us and the empty space between us. 
And I realized, oh, shit, I'm in trouble. (laughs) (laughs) You're a poet, Will. (laughs) Well, I had another question, but that that piece of poetry now made me want to ask another question. Um, Because so a couple weeks ago we had on Carrie Jenkins, who is this philosopher who she herself is queer and polyamorous. And she wrote this amazing book about the like examining the nature of romantic love and deconstructing what romantic love is. And a lot of the research studies that she cited that have been uh, performed up to this point, they very much associate romantic love and that NRE feeling with also this surge of sexual attraction, that that's a huge component mm-hmm. in it. And we realize, like, but huh, like, they haven't, there haven't really been any research studies on people who are asexual who don't feel any sexual attraction, but who still will fall in love with love, someone yeah. or feel romantic attraction to someone. Um, and so it's so interesting to think about that, that, so for you, that you do feel that um, I guess that that you know typical thing that we would call NRE, mm-hmm. but I think for so many of us to divorce that from also feeling sexual attraction for a person is so mind-boggling. But I love that you shared that story because I think that probably another common misconception is that people think that people who are asexual um, are just what like depressed, like de- aren't actually in love, like haven't found someone they're actually attracted to, like things like that. Right. Um, yeah, I. For most of my life, um, I have been um, either, I I have been teased either affectionately or angrily for being a robot or a Vulcan Mm. because I am very, um, perhaps it's that I don't, um, I don't express things physically as fluidly as some people do, or maybe it's because this, this, um, this physical component is not quite there or it's routed differently through my brain. I, I have a, I tend to have a small gap between my, uh, receiving some sort of stimuli and whatever I do to respond to that. And in that gap, I'm able to think about what actions I want to take and I'm able to be a lot more conscious in my direction. Um, Mm -hmm. so I'm less likely to have, you know, sharp outbursts of anger. And sometimes that's what, uh, sometimes we have, I have fought with partners about the fact that I don't fight with partners the way that they want me to fight because they want, like, they want me to shout and break things and like demonstrate this passion. And I am often perceived as being cold when that's what's on the outside is not what's on the inside. If I could pivot us a little bit, Uh, Another thing that we've touched on a little bit already, but I wanted to talk about a little bit more, are gender differences within the ace community uh, in terms of the the experience of being a person who, you know, is identified by others as a certain gender. We've talked a little bit about that, the expectation on men to, you know, be DTF all the time and that if you reject someone, it's almost insulting or like you're calling them a slut or whatever, like the examples that you right. gave. Um, I was curious from your experience, uh, you know, cause you used to lead a discussion group, um, about asexuality. Um, you know, what were the kinds of things that you heard in terms of gender differences? Cause I'd imagine on the other side, like we were talking about using that demisexual label just to be like, Oh, but I'm not a slut that I could imagine a lot of women who identify as asexual could get a similar type of sort of disbelief of being like, yeah, okay, sure you are. But like all women just don't really want sex that much or I don't know, those sorts of assumptions that have you, have you come across people sharing a lot of those kinds of experiences or is there something else too? I I would say, I would, I would say yes, but that, that fear is, is mostly universal. Like that expectation for sex, like that was a, that was a common thread in, in the discussion. It was the, uh, it was always phrased as, so things are getting more serious. Um, and, and, you know, I know that my partner or this person that I'm dating, perhaps they're not even partners yet. Excuse me. Um, we've reached the point where I know that they want that. How do we have that discussion? Because often the ACE part of it for some people doesn't come up until they're a few dates in. 
Mm. Yeah, I was I was going to ask about that earlier. That I mean, it kind of echoes a common question that we get from people, which is like, when do I talk to someone about polyamory or non monogamy or whatever? Yeah. You know, like do right. I do it before yeah. the first date, on the first date? Do I wait for a couple dates? Like, what do you have any particular advice for people wanting to broach that conversation with a potential new partner? Hmm. I I feel that something like this should come up sooner rather than later. Yeah. Because um, if if you're in a position where you know that, um, so if I can speak broadly to the quote guys of the uh, of the ace community, uh-huh. definitely bring this up earlier. Because what I have found is that without this information, um, potential partners tend to misread your lack of sexual. Uh, aggressiveness as disinterest Mm -hmm. and that often triggers like anger and resentment and like am I not good enough what's going on here and they internalize it as something that's wrong with them instead of this is about somebody else's experience Mm -hmm. and uh and, and that's a really important distinction because this has to do with the way that I process information. It has nothing to do with how attractive you are. Mm. And those two things are corollary for, for the majority of our population. Um, likewise, speaking to the generalized women of the audience, uh, it is important because, uh, and, and really for, for everyone, that it is a common expectation among I, I, th- I think it's 98% of people. I think only 1% to 2% of people are really a sp- spectrum. Mm. So for 98% of people, this is the norm. This is what they can expect. So it's very important early on to set the expectation that, like, no, this probably isn't going to happen. You know, if, no. you're, if you're in the, in the category of this probably isn't going to happen. Um, otherwise, if you're more on the, on the demisexual side of things, explaining, these are the needs that I have in order to facilitate this. Um, these are my emotional needs, my intimacy needs. Um, I've discovered that the kink helps, Hmm. um, having a DS relationship, uh, helps to satisfy an emotional connection in a way that I didn't expect would necessarily, um, and I, I think it's due to that that emotional intimacy that you get in that sort of dynamic. But whatever your needs are, I think it's important to communicate those early on because people have a right to opt into that or say, I'm sorry, that's not for me. And yeah. I, I hate the expression of just friends, but uh, as a relationship anarchist, I hate that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I... I think that it's important to say, like, okay, I understand where you are. I still think you're cool and I want to spend time with you, but I'm looking for a sexual partner and, you know, I, I need to pursue that too. Mm. Mm. Thank you. All right, we're getting toward the end of our time here, um, but we did want to ask you a couple last things. And one is, um, we've probably already covered it, but maybe you could just reiterate it. Is there just one thing that you wish the poly community or just the community in general understood about asexuality? Um, it's, it's that we exist. <laughs> it's a, uh, it, it is an actual sexuality. Uh, there is still, uh, there is still some, some disbelief that it is real, that it's not something clinical or diagnosable. Um, to that end, we have our own mythical creature, our own representation. Um, Aces often use the the dragon as the okay. iconography of nice. asexuality, That's like nice. unicorns and the Pegasus. It's yeah. a mythical that doesn't really exist, but, but very it powerful. does. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's super badass. I love it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> So um, that's, I mean, at least at least we have that going for us. And, uh, <laughs> and, and on that note, um, my my current partner has really embraced that, and her. She started referring to me as her dragon, and Aww. that is the most adorable thing. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, so we, we usually close our interviews with our one question, which is, um, you know, what would be the one piece of advice you would like to give to people who are just starting out in non-monogamy, 
But I wanted to alter that a little bit for you uh, because of this topic. And I feel like it needs to split into two parts. But one <laughs> of those is, what would be one... What would be a, one way that understanding the asexuality spectrum could help someone in their own life? And I mean mm -hmm. this in two ways. One is understanding themselves. Like if you had something you wanted to say to people who might think, oh, my God, this might be me. Uh, and then the second part of it is um, how understanding asexuality better can help them treat other people in their poly community better. Mm. Wow, we got deep. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's a Super difficult wrap-up question. I know. Yeah. So, that one kind of meandered a couple places. <laughs> so for anybody for whom this might apply personally, I would definitely recommend that they go to asexuality.org and look through the descriptions, the FAQs, um, and, and start looking at, at all of the information that's available there and some of the common misconceptions about uh, about sexual attraction and sex drive and behavior and how those three things are not all corollary or mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. um, as far as understanding the, the greater open poly community, I think that being aware that, uh, that we need to always try to hold space for people in terms of what they need and negotiate every part of a relationship and not leave anything to be assumed. Um, that's that's where I would leave that in the in the greater open space. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's hey, a that great. That's a great beautiful guidance for summary. everybody. Loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. You you mentioned asexuality.org yeah. a moment ago, um, and you'd say that's yes. probably the best resource for people to go to um, to learn more about mm -hmm. it. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to leave our listeners with? I don't think so. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I thank appreciate you so it. Much. This is fantastic. I feel yeah. like I learned so much. I've learned so much. Like this so is so much. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. 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 Awesome. All well, right. the one true dragon will. <laughs> one true <laughs> dragon will. <laughs> as you shall now Best be of luck yes. in, in your new relationship as well. Thank you. Yeah. I, I got a lot out of this interview yeah, personally. Seriously. Like I, I awesome. really learned a lot on this topic. Which was exciting. I, I feel so lucky. I'm so glad that just another thing that's so great about connecting to your local community. I love that. That's, I mean, that's how we met the one true will, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that is so great to meet this person face to face. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, and so we just wanted to say, if you want to check out more of our stuff, you can go to multiamory.com. You can also find us on iTunes and Stitcher and wherever fine podcasts are sold. Uh, our Patreon is patreon.com slash multiamory. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitter, all those places. All those places. Mm -hmm. uh, we love hearing from you. Also, if you would like to call in and leave your questions for us to potentially talk about on the show, that number again is 678-M-U-L-T-I-05. Nice. Uh, yes. 678-MULTI-05. Uh, we're really excited to hear what kinds of questions you all have uh, or, you know, your feedback or your observations or any of that and to start incorporating some of that interaction into our show. We're really excited about that. Uh, and lastly, we wanted to thank Josh and Anand for our theme song, uh, which is called Forms I Know I Did, off of their album Fractal Cave EP. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you that was a deep that one out of your ass, <laughs> Yeah. Well done. That was off of their EP. Uh, yes. Thank you, Josh and Anand, for that. And we'll see you next week. And we'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.